Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and welcome to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today I'm extraordinarily pleased to have with me as my guest Vince Walden. Vince is a partner at Ernst & Young and he and I were on a couple of radio programs last year and he put forth some concepts that I thought really uh, were at the cutting edge of best practices compliance programs. So first of all Vince, uh, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it and welcome. Thanks, Tom. Glad to uh, glad to be invited. Um, as most com compliance practitioners know, the Department of Justice suggests that any best practices or effective compliance program would prevent um, <clears throat> violations, detect them, and remediate them after you found them. But what I uh, kind of discovered uh, listening to Vince talk is he's taken the prevention concept, what I think is several paces past that. Um, in addition to uh, prevention, he really takes the use of the information that he thinks companies own themselves, in other words, their own data, and moves to uh, prescription. So uh, what I really like to explore is that concept with you, Vince. Uh, you really articulated it quite well in our radio show, and uh, if I've not uh, adequ adequately articulated it, please do so. Yeah, thanks, Tom. You know, what's interesting is my book of business over the last three to four years has really changed from the reactive investigating and responding to inquiries, and in particularly around the FCPA type violations, to really taking a lot of those lessons learned uh, from those investigations and making it proactive and developing a lot of these tests and analytics on a proactive basis from a, and to help companies monitor for these types of fraud risks, around, particularly around bribery and corruption. And so that, that topic of how things have changed um, and what companies are doing about it, there is definitely a more proactive stance to not just look at the policies and controls. And I think by now, most companies have policies and procedures in place. And if you're a global Fortune 500 or global 1000, you probably have some for some FCPA or some compliance program in place. I'd be shocked if you didn't. But what's changing now is really putting teeth to a lot of those policies and procedures and testing transactions. And that's where a lot of these analytics come in play. It's actually testing the effectiveness of the policies and procedures you have in place. And that's where forensic data analytics can really play a key role. Can you really explain how that role has evolved? Because uh, certainly as a lawyer, I would uh, call upon uh, a specialist like yourself to come in and perform an audit, uh, do maybe a deep dive, but really it's a retrospective look back. And it may tell me some information about what happened in the past, but you, you seem to be able to explain it in a way to show how it's evolved. Could you talk us through that? Sure. You know, what's interesting, it's, it goes so much more than just the traditional, you know, travel and entertainment tests or, or looking at payment disbursements, you know, and, and running some some spreadsheet kind of queries, or I call them some of the rules-based tests. One of the big changes that we've seen is that rather than focusing on specific data sources to run tests, kind of somewhat the approach. And let me give you like in a pharmaceutical you know, the way test. So rather than focusing on the data source and trying to mine and, and analyze data that way, some of us have big data thinking. Uh, and new approaches, focus on the entity or the individual rather than the data source. So take, for example, uh, in the pharmaceutical space, interactions with healthcare professionals, such as doctors and what have you. And those healthcare professionals are being asked by the pharmaceutical companies to speak at uh, various speaking events, you know, to talk about the drugs that they're prescribing. Sure. Uh, they're taken to dinner from a meals and entertainment perspective. They're given free samples of product. Uh, they're being chatted about or conversed with via email. They're requesting certain medical information information that could be perceived as potentially off-label. And again, what's interesting is as you think about monitoring your risks, it's not about focusing on the data. It's focusing on the individual. So looking at all those data sources around the individual and actually developing scoring models that risk rank uh, those individuals, such as you know, who are the top ten healthcare professionals that we're interacting with, um, because they're getting the most free samples and they're getting asked to speak all the time and they're getting wined and dined. Pulling all those together around that gives you a much broader perspective of risk. 
And it's not just in life sciences. I mean, you can take this from a vendor approach as well. So look at who are the top payees in your vendor master. Uh, and again, forgive me, I'm you know talking some specific accounting terms, but Fair but, but it's but generally speaking, you know it's uh, you know everybody can understand you know who's getting paid, who are the vendors getting paid, and you know are they also getting um, are they also getting wined and dined? Are they also is there a potential conflict of interest with uh, you know some employee's friend or family as well? And pulling all those data sources together around the entity is one of the key differences um, that has been really increased a lot of the monitoring effectiveness in, in, in the analytics program. Vince, are you seeing uh, your clients or others that uh, you talk to becoming receptive to this type of analysis or approach? Oh, yes. Um, and I would say particularly in those industries that are most susceptible to global bribery and corruption and, and the enforcement trends that are happening. So we see a lot of this receptiveness in, of course, life sciences. We're seeing it in the energy space and oil and gas, particularly financial services, of course, even media and entertainment, etc. So look who's, look who's being investigated, and those are typically the industries that are that are more receptive to these more advanced anti-corruption type analytics. Vince, what would you suggest to a company who may come to you, a multi-billion dollar multinational uh, that says, you know, we've grown organically, we've grown through mergers and acquisitions, uh, we have stock splits, uh, we've done a number of things, but the reality is we have 33 ERP systems. Uh, right. We say we have SAP, but it's, you know, SAP that's been cloned, not, not cloned, but designed to us specifically. What can you do for a company that has such a wide variety of input sources? Yeah, you know, my advice is take a risk-based approach and start small. Um, and, and again, it's rare that you can find companies on a single instance of whatever ERP or, you know, an SAP systems. You run into them every so often and you congratulate them and you say, you know, wow, <laughs> you probably spent $100 million trying to get there so you can say that. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the next time they make an acquisition, they got to spend a lot more money to try to integrate it onto that system. So, you know, most companies are exactly as you described. They've got dozens, if not more, uh, systems located throughout the, the world, and uh, data is not centrally located. And, and my advice there, and you can do a lot of effective monitoring and analytics by just taking a risk-based approach. Focus on your risks. Pick those one, two, or three, or maybe top five countries or business units, identify what those risks are, and then back into those data sources. And from there, you know, maybe those will live in maybe one or two ERP systems, and pull your data from that. And what happens is, and again, I, I kind of say that these analytics, it's more of a journey, not a destination. It's not like you're just going to do it once and be done. It's you do it in those high-risk areas, you evaluate the results, and on odds are you'll typically find things to improve. It may not be a violation, but there's always areas of cost recoveries or efficiencies to be gained or policies that need enhanced. And what you'll find is by integrating these new analytics and going from kind of an Excel spreadsheet where you're looking at rows and columns traditionally to now some of these more visual data analytics dashboards where you can drill down, you can risk score and prioritize, people, have started, people start viewing these analytics far more as a business tool not just a not just an audit sample selection, and um, or even and the word spreads, a, or even heaven forbid a compliance tool. Yeah, or yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, it's it's actually viewed as a business tool uh, that's for compliance monitoring, but it can also help the business. And you'll see even some of when compliance or internal audits the sponsor of these you know, analytics initiatives, we even see pull from the business unit leads and the division managers to say, hey, I want that dashboard. Um, and and what we obviously what we find is you know business unit leads talk to one another, and there's almost a pull. So it's you'll do the first five countries, and then a couple months or the next quarter you'll do five, and you just take it slowly throughout the organization. And lo and behold, you know, in over the course of 12 to 18 months, uh, you've got a pretty good and robust compliance program. Uh one of the things that struck me at the recent Dow Jones conference, which we both both attended, was the uh, CCO from Pfizer, uh, and he was asked. I can't remember the question, but he he talked about the high 
profile level of pharmaceutical companies, not just in the FCPA space, but after uh, Obamacare, uh, that's certainly on the forefront of many people's minds, and indeed across uh, the world with an aging population, uh, various factors that have really driven the profile and potential reputational risk of companies uh, in the life sciences space. Um, they have risks that are much broader than the FCPA, yet they all need to be looked at it. Uh, how does a company begin to get their arms around uh, the, the risk in the risk-based approach that you've uh, articulated? You know, that's a, that's a very good question. That's why uh, the uh, profession of chief compliance officer is a, is a, is a very popular uh, and, and emerging uh, uh, profession. In fact, what's interesting, I was at the uh, Pharmaceutical Compliance Conference in Dubai last week, and they talked about the chief compliance officer role uh, is one of the fastest roles, I think, uh, within the C-suite one of the most fastest emerging professions uh, that they've seen where the chief compliance officer role has really only come into fruition over the past maybe 10, 15 years um, where before that role never existed and it has direct communication you know, with either the CEO or you know, high level up in the organization. Um, that point, your, your point of um, how that role, you know, how do you even grapple with all these different risk factors um, is, is a key one. Um, now, first and foremost, you know, look at what the regulators are, are, are pursuing. You know, of course, bribery and corruption is a hot area. But also in the pharma space, you know, there's in the U.S., label marketing. Um, right. There's also issues. I was talking to one of my at IBM uh, and uh, some of the technology that they're deploying. There's a big demand for, you know, monitoring the uh, counterfeit drugs that are being manufactured and sold on the online. And how do you monitor that? I mean, the compliance officer has just got a ton of risks uh, that they need to incorporate and, again, prioritize by market, by region. Uh, you know, it's not an easy task. Um, one of the things that's always intrigued me, is, uh, as I'm a lawyer and, and, and uh, you know, you're a CPA, is the complementary natures of our profession in the compliance space. Could you describe how, at least perhaps at E&Y, uh, your consulting team could can work with someone like you to help a company move forward, but starting with the really the analytics approach that you've articulated? Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting that what we find where we add a lot of value is that um, first and foremost, you have to ask the right questions. If you don't start with the data and you don't start with the test. You start with what are the right questions that we should be asking. And that's really where the legal profession and the compliance officer and the business unit, you know, the, the business unit owner and, and the investigative professionals can say, look, here are the risks and the issues that we're seeing and start there. What do we want to, what's our key performance indicators? How do we measure, what do we know what bad looks like? And from that perspective, then say, all right, here's what we want to measure and monitor. And that takes the, from a legal perspective, from a business perspective, we get that down. And then you backfill into what data sources would you need to create that report and how would you go about analyzing it? And so for my role, you know, as a, as a, from a forensic data analytics perspective, I often team with attorneys, both in-house counsel and outside counsel, to help design and understand what are the right questions that should be asked based on this specific situation. And then my skills and my team can help backfill what are those data sources, where does it live, and use my accounting skill sets from a, you know, from a financial accounting perspective to pull in what needs to be um, analyzed and put it into a easy to use interface so that it can mean something uh, and, and, and provide some business insight to the client and that client being you know internal or external counsel or compliance or what have you. Um, a couple of years ago uh, Eli Lilly uh, uh, had an FCPA enforcement action uh, against it, and one of the areas of concern expressed in the enforcement action was around charitable donations. And the uh, SEC uh, civil complaint detailed when a charitable donation was made, the amount that was made, and then the date that a contract was either awarded or uh, a contract paid, a benefit received by Eli Lilly. And one of the things that struck yeah. me was there was no way for companies 
to take a look at if there's a sales spike in one region or one country, if there are a large amount of charitable donations, and if there's uh, specific contracts that are awarded by one uh, uh, systems manager or foreign governmental official, I guess would be the better term. Is there any way that companies can use this analytical approach to tie those together so they can get a better handle on these things? See, and that's where, you know, if you think about that entity approach is, uh, is key. And when you can pull in, in fact, grants and donations obviously is one key area of a data source that you want to monitor. And, and again, you may not see, you know, that grant and donations going to that specific customer. But you might, when you compare the customer master to, uh, let's just say, the recipient's, when you compare the customer master to the recipient's uh, name, address, and phone number of the grant, you might see some overlap. So maybe it's not going to the company itself, but it's going to the spouse of the owner of the company or, or the company's cousin or, or what have you. And that analytical thinking of being able to pull those data sources together, and that's just kind of one specific test. Let me take the customer master, compare it to the, the master of grant recipients. And, you know, people aren't going to be as bold. I hope they're not, at least. Sometimes it <laughs> happen to, to use the exact same name. But they will use maybe a similar address or a similar phone number or some other field in those two databases that will match. And that could pose the conflict of interest that then would allow you to go in and say, wait a second, we see this customer with the same phone number as this grant recipient. And by the way, we've paid, that customer's done X amount of business over time and we see a spike around the, you know, the holiday season or what have you. And at the same time, we see a huge spike in grants being donated or promised to, to be donated. And that's that kind of analytical thinking that comes together. Um, I've probably heard from uh, forensic specialists like you uh, for many, many years uh, the, really the, the most basic test to run on the vendor master is see if multiple companies have the same address. And for reasons that are beyond me, that's a concept that we in the compliance field can't get our hands around to use as a basic fraud detection tool. And uh, it, it really seems to me that, or it's occurred to me that uh, corruption is just another form of fraud and the tools and skills that you would use to uh, uncover internal fraud are really the same tools and skills that you would use to uncover corruption. It's just in a different name. Would you say that's a fair assessment or would you go a different direction? Almost. You know, for sure. If I think about uh, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, Fraud Tree, and they, they publish the Fraud Tree in uh, just about every, uh, their report to the nation, they do it every two years in their survey. You know, there's three main categories of fraud. There's financial misstatement, if you think about, you know, back in the old school 2000 time frame of the Enrons and the Worldcoms of the world, classic financial misstatement cooking the books. Right. There's asset misappropriation type schemes, which is the typical theft of assets, you know, the control environment. Uh, oftentimes internal audit really looks at those control environments. And the third category is corruption. So, you know, corruption is absolutely a subset of fraud. And of course, FCPA, you know, with the government officials, et cetera, is all within that corruption world. Um, so I would say it's a subset. One of the key differentiators though, and this has really changed my game in terms of how we develop an, a an a analytics for it, is that in the context of corruption, you're not going to see things in the aggregate in terms of uh, when you're looking at data in aggregate. You've got to get into the transaction details. And one of the, the most interesting things for corruption is determining corrupt intent. Right. And one of the key takeaways, I would say, for the audience is that when you integrate, you need to consider what people are putting in the free text descriptions of payments or transactions, because that gives you a really good indicator of corrupt intent. Like when I see a payment to a third party, and I've seen this, when it says friend fee as a payment, <laughs> what the heck is a friend fee? You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Or, you know, you see special payment, one-time payment. I've seen things as blunt as Rolex watch to the president of XYZ country. That's a suspicion, you know, and it was like a $10,000 entry. That's a suspicion, you know, that, that's corrupt intent right there. And so one of the things that's different for monitoring corruption as opposed to traditional, you know, financial misstatement type tests is how you can overlay the traditional payment descriptions uh, you know, like the round, looking for round dollar amounts, which is indicative of cash, and those kind of tra traditional rules-based tests. But overlaying it with the text mining, 
because you really get a good uh, measure of corrupt intent. Um, and there's all sorts of techniques that we can do around text mining, concept analysis, link analysis, uh, term frequency analysis, etc., that gives you that purview into corrupt intent. Well, Vince, uh, we're near the end of our, to of our time here, and I don't want to take any more of your time. I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us. If uh, any of our listeners wanted to uh, get in touch with you, could uh, they email you or contact you in some other way? Sure, Tom. Um, my email address is vincent.walden at ey.com. I can also be reached here in my New York office at 212-773-3643. And again, thank you for this uh, opportunity to chat with you and your audience. Well, and I would just say if there's anybody out there who really wants to take their program to the next level, get in touch with Vince because uh, he is just, we have just scratched the surface of the things that uh, he can bring to, uh, for a proactive and indeed I would say a proscriptive help for your compliance program. I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us. Thanks a lot. Tom, thank you very much. Take care.